conviction appears in many of the Buddhist lists of the factors we need in the practice. It's the first of the noble treasures. It's the first of the strengths, the first of the five faculties. When the Buddha compares the practice to building a fortress at the edge of a frontier, conviction is the foundation post. You have to understand a little bit about construction practices in Asia to understand what that means. Whenever you build a building, here in the West we lay a foundation. Over there they set up a post. That's the beginning of the construction. Even when you build a city, they put up a symbolic post. That's what they call the Lak Mugu in Bangkok, and there's also one in Chiang Mai, and quite a few of the other provincial capitals of Thailand. It's a shrine. That was the first thing that was set out when the city was to be built. And they were very careful about the, the time and the place to make sure that it would be auspicious. So conviction is the very beginning. Conviction in what? Conviction in the Buddha's awakening. That's the standard answer. But what does that mean for us? Well, think about the Buddha's awakening. He found an end to suffering through his own efforts. And he did it by developing qualities that were not exclusive to him. As he said, he had heedfulness, ardency, resolution. And these are all qualities that we can develop within ourselves. So conviction basically means conviction in the power of human action. At the very least, to make a difference between whether you're going to suffer and whether you're not going to suffer. And ideally, conviction in the power of human action, your human action, to lead to the end of suffering. As the Buddha encourage you, he could do it. Others can do it as well. Human beings can do it. You're a human being. You can do it too. However, conviction here is not an unquestioning conviction. It's a conviction that the Buddha encourages us to test. As when you're setting up a building, you put the foundation post in the ground, and then you shake it a little bit to make sure that it doesn't shake, to make sure that it's firm. In the same way, the Buddha doesn't tell you to be unquestioning with his teachings. In fact, he encourages you to test them. It's because he believes in the power of action to make a difference. That's how beliefs can be tested. If you didn't believe that actions could make a difference, then how could you test something? If you believe something, it would make any difference at all. But here we're making the assertion that because you believe certain things, it's going to have an impact on your actions, and those, in, those actions in turn will have an impact on the happiness or the pain, pleasure or pain, happiness or sorrow that you meet with. So this is the kind of conviction that you want to shake a little bit, ask questions. The Buddha himself asked a lot of questions in the course of his awakening. You look at the teachings of the Ajans. These are not people who simply believe what they were told. As John Mahabhu once said, try to prove the Buddha wrong. Don't simply follow in line with what you hear. And you look at the teachings of the various Ajans. The teaching, for instance, that everything is impermanent and constant. They like to point out that there are certain things that are constant. And John Cha talks about how things change. But the way they change is constant. There are rules still where things change. Things may be not for sure, as he likes to say, my na. But they do follow certain patterns. If they didn't follow certain patterns, we'd be up a creek if we tried to put together a path of practice. And John Lee likes to point out how certain things don't change. As you said, your lower lip never pushed its way up to become your upper lip. 
Your hand never became a foot. Your foot never became a, an eye. And you look at his explanations of the three characteristics. He says, before you really can understand inconstancy, stress, not self, you have to take what's inconstant and make it constant. You take what's stressful and make it easeful. Take what's not self and get it under your control. In other words, you take this mind. Which is so quick to change. You try to keep it focused on one thing. Continually. You take this body, which has its aches and pains, which when you sit for long periods of time usually can get very stiff, and you learn how to sit for a long period of time with a sense of well-being. You take your thoughts, which tend to be beyond your control, and you learn how to control them, keeping them focused on one topic, the topic you want, and see how far you can go with that. Ultimately, as he says, you have to end up letting go of both sides, what's constant and inconstant, stressful, easeful, not self, under your control. But before you're really going to understand these three characteristics, you have to push against them. And there's something in the Buddhist teachings that encourages that. On the one hand, it does have us be convinced in the power of action. This was one of the teachings that he defended most. One of the teachings that he had to go out of his way to explain again and again and again. We tend to think that karma was something that everybody believed in his time. Well, people believed in action, that there was such a thing. Most people did. There were people who believed that action was unreal. But a lot of people who believed in action believed that it was powerless. You can do things, but it's not going to have an impact. Or else what you do is the result of forces coming in from the past. Those kinds of teachings the Buddha rejected. He had to explain karma again and again, that there is a pattern for good actions leading to good results, bad actions leading to bad results. But it's not totally deterministic. And so you have to experiment to see what you can do. Think about his teachings about the five aggregates. In his second sermon, he asked the monks, Can you say, may my form be thus, may it not be thus, may feelings be thus, may they not be thus? Same with perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. In each case, the five brethren said, No. So which is it? Can you do things or can you not do things with these aggregates? Well, you can do some things. And it's the some things that are important. It's in that area of some things that you can actually create a path out of those aggregates. And it will take you to where you want to go. Once it's taking you there, they'll fall apart. But that doesn't matter because you've arrived. And you arrive because you tested things, you question things. To what extent can you change your form? Well, you work with the breath. How do you change your feelings? Well, you will work with the breath. You can change your perceptions more directly. Sometimes this takes willpower. You're used to perceiving things in a certain way. And the Buddha recommends, or John Lee recommends, other perceptions. And the tendency of the mind is to fall back to its old perceptions. But you're trying to see, how far can I push in another direction? Because you want to make a path. The path is something you do make. It doesn't happen on its own. The same principle applies to thought fabrications. If you want to change what you're conscious of, well, you can change your form and feelings, etc. The quality of your consciousness will change. You can spread your awareness to fill the whole body. That's something that can be done. You can create a path.
We may not have total control over the aggregates, but we can control some things. They do give us enough leeway so we can create the path to the end of suffering. That's all we really need. So conviction doesn't mean you simply believe everything you're told, especially when you have conviction in your actions. You can use your actions then to test how far can you go through the power of your thoughts and your words and your deeds. This is why the Buddha made such an important part of his training that the monks were trained in cross-questioning rather than trained in bombast. To be trained in bombast means that you listen to beautiful words, but you're not encouraged to ask what they mean. In other words, in other words the teaching is there for the glory of the teacher, to say really nice things. When you're trained in cross-questioning, you're encouraged to ask, what is the meaning of this? How far does this go? The teacher is encouraged to give you clear answers. The teacher is also encouraged to question you. It's through this questioning that you move your way from conviction to knowledge. There's that famous passage where the Buddha asks Venerable Sardabhuta, are you convinced that the five strengths of conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment lead to the deathless? And Sardabhuta says, no, I'm not convinced, I know. And how did he know? Because he questioned things, tested things, tested himself. So even though conviction is the foundation post, it's not the whole building. And before you put up the whole building, you want to make sure the poster is really strong. So try moving it around. And you're convinced that it's really firm, because it is based not only on conviction, but it becomes based on knowledge. <laughs>